Well, I think we are good to go. Thank you for your patience. Um, and so we'll go ahead and get started with the talks. Um, and uh, as you can see here, we'll start with talking about the multiple systems that are involved in Parkinson's. And really, what one of the take-home messages for today's session is to think of that the motor features, the cardinal motor features that are listed here, are only part and parcel of actually Parkinson's. And we want to instill that this is actually the tip of the iceberg, as you can see here uh, below, that focusing on the substantia nigra, which we know has pathological involvement in Parkinson's and degeneration of nigra striatal tracts, really is only part of the picture. And as you'll see, there are many symptoms beyond the motor features that can be explained by pathologies in other parts of the brain areas. And I'm going to leave some of this for my colleague to talk about when he discusses the etiologies. But just to keep in mind that some of these motor features are just the tip of the iceberg. So in fact, actually, multiple systems can be involved in Parkinson's. And as you can see in this uh, uh, depiction from a nice review paper a few years back, there are multiple areas, so from the gastrointestinal, uh, uh, gastrointestinal system to cognition to pain to smell to sleep. This is much more complicated and uh, then lends itself to a much more comprehensive approach when we take care of patients with Parkinson's. And so we're going to touch on many of these systems in the talk today. So just first to make sure that we're all on the same page uh, in thinking about the motor issues, I wanted to spend uh, a few moments talking about some of the early signs and then some of the more advanced motor features that we see, and then to discuss many of the non-motor features that are also encountered in Parkinson's. And as you can see here, there are some early signs and symptoms that patients with Parkinson's may experience. Classically, we might think of a unilateral rest tremor or decreased arm swing or having bradykinesia or trouble with manual dexterity. We may think of decreased facial expression, smaller handwriting, and softer speech. And I just want to call attention to two as well here that young patients may present with a foot dystonia, um, with their foot turning in or toes cramping, and many times often present to a foot doctor or an orthopedist. Many patients may present with pain in their shoulder, which may be related to the rigidity or decreased uh, swing of their arm. And it's not infrequent that we get referrals from orthopedists. So again, keeping in mind that multiple systems uh, beyond uh, neurological can be involved. There can be uh, other advanced signs and symptoms related to motor issues, and we know this as we've followed patients over time in our clinic, as I'm sure many of you have, where we see that they have worsened motor severity of their tremor, bradykinesia, rigidity, posture, uh, walking, and balance troubles as they've had Parkinson's for more and more years. They can also develop changes in how they respond to the medicine, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, later this morning, with phenomenon called wearing off, where the medicines don't last as long as they used to, or unpredictable responses, where they might take a dose, but it doesn't really take as much effect. They may have stiffness when they first get up in the morning or trouble uh, at nighttime when the medicines are not working as well, meaning having recurrent tremor or turning over in their bed. They may also develop dyskinesias, and I'll show some examples of what those involuntary movements look like. They may have freezing of gait, and as well as trouble with walking and balance that can lead to falls and safety issues. And many of these can be like a roller coaster from patients taking the medicine and being on when it's working well to when it starts wearing off after uh, several hours to an off state. And for many patients, they become very dependent on taking the doses of medicine to keep them in that on state. And so that kind of becomes like this roller coaster effect. So I wanted to touch on some of the symptoms that people may be a little less familiar with in terms of thinking about classic Parkinson's beyond the tremor uh, that we see at rest, beyond uh, slow shuffling gait, and beyond um, bradykinesia or slowness of movement. And one of these is a, a phenomenon called freezing of gait. 
And freezing of gait is um, an occurrence where people have a brief episodic absence or a marked reduction of the forward progression of their feet, despite their intent to walk. So they might try, look like they're trying to get started and cross over a doorway or turn around, but their feet are really kind of stuck and they can't make those steps go. It can also look like they're standing and trembling in place, kind of just shaky, starting to get going or shuffling forward, or they can have a complete block in their movement. This can actually be quite situational, where patients um, experience this when they start to walk. So their first step, they might get up out of a chair and try to take their first step. They might have it when they're turning, so um, you know, changing direction, or going through a doorway or a narrow uh, hallway. Um, and they can also have this when they're trying to do more than one activity at once. So thinking and talking while they're walking. Um, so that's what we mean by dual tasking. And here you can see in a, in a picture here uh, a gentleman trying to take some steps. And if you can envision in the still frames here, these short kind of uh, shuffling steps that, that prevent him from getting going. And it takes him many, many steps to, to make this turn. Here you can actually see a trick that he had by having a little strap that he pulls up on his foot to get it, get it going, and it enables him to turn around and keep his stride. Now the thoughts behind freezing of gait may relate to changes in the basal ganglia automaticity. It may, make, it may relate to changes in the message from the brain to the spinal cord. It may also relate to increased cognitive load in patients who may be having cognitive difficulties. Hence, it's hard for them to do two things at once and hard to do them very well at the same time. As you can see here, uh, much of this relies on the frontal systems that have to do with attention uh, um, and um, uh, cognitive uh, uh, interpretation of the surroundings and multitasking. There are a number of other issues. Um, we may be very familiar with these when we hear patients talk. So their speech may be softer. They may have some dysarthria. They can also have festination of their speech, where they get faster, faster, faster as they talk. Um, some patients have uh, new onset stuttering. Patients can have difficulty with swallowing uh, as well as drooling. And we'll touch on that a little later because this is one of those issues that can greatly affect quality of life if patients are constantly having to carry a tissue or a handkerchief because they uh, have uh, increased uh, 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 salivary secretions. And this may relate to the fact that um, swallowing mechanisms could be slower, there may be um, decreased motility, uh, and potentially uh, some element of hypersalivation. So I mentioned before that there's a whole host of non-motor problems in Parkinson's, and that's really part of what generated this concept that Parkinson's is much more than a motor disorder, uh, and several of these are listed here. We're going to touch on many of these. Uh, this is a little bit of a whirlwind tour through the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's, really to highlight what, what um, these conditions uh, look like and what we might encounter in patients that we don't often always think about when we see them in clinic. So one of the things that's come up over time is that potentially some of these non-motor symptoms might even start before the motor symptoms. Here you can see a diagram with uh, time on the x-axis and perhaps years before neuronal function and neurodegeneration, um, and there may be premotor symptoms that patients experience, and we'll talk a little bit more about these later, that can relate to sleep dysfunction, like REM behavior disorder, constipation, loss of smell, and mood disorders that can even occur 5, 10, 15, 20 years before someone comes into the office with tremor or a shuffling gait. And so this has really revolutionized the way we think about Parkinson's and pot potentially the way we might uh, have strategies to prevent it or slow down its progression. We know that these non-motor symptoms even occur in de novo and early Parkinson's cohorts. So many people probably think that, oh, these are just late stage problems in Parkinson's. It's motor for the first part, and then, oh, it's only later on that patients would have blood pressure issues or cognitive issues. But actually, that's not the case. 
So there's several studies looking at um, early Parkinson's uh, cohorts that have compared the frequency of uh, a wide range of non-motor symptoms to healthy controls uh, about the same age, gender, uh, and other demographics. And as you can hear this, as you can see here, there's a short list of many of uh, the non-motor symptoms that were more frequent in Parkinson's patients at the time of their diagnosis and even before medications and uh, compared to healthy controls. And these are two uh, samples um, uh, from Europe and the UK. We know that these non-motor symptoms occur later in Parkinson's. This is uh, data from the Sydney Longitudinal Study that's followed patients uh, over 20 years, and they found that much of these are what uh, predominate uh, in advanced disease and are associated with poor outcomes. You can see here with the percentages that these are quite frequent occurrences. So as I mentioned, there are multiple systems that are involved, uh, just to highlight a few of these here. And to say a word or two on uh, each one of these, um, because it's important to recognize them as being part of uh, Parkinson's and their effect on the patients. So one of these is the musculoskeletal system. Uh, these are two examples of postural abnormalities that can occur in Parkinson's. So here you can see um, a gentleman uh, on the left side with what's called Pisa syndrome, where you can see he has lateral flexion uh, um, of his spine, um, leaning towards one side, kind of like the Tower of Pisa. And then on the right here, a woman with camptochormia, or bent spine. And these can be um, a, a lead to marked difficulty with patients as well as pain um, uh, and a lot of trouble uh, when walking and sitting. We can also see changes in the skin. So classically, we think of some uh, seborrhea-type changes in Parkinson's, as you can see here in the picture. Patients may have oily, flaking, inflamed skin. They may have dry skin. Um, this abuts the changes that we see in the autonomic system, that they can have increased sweating, or perhaps even the opposite, too little sweating. And I will say this is one of the most common uh, complaints I hear in clinic, and uh, one of those that's very, very difficult to treat. Sometimes this can be linked to having lots of dyskinesias and just, you know, lots of um, extra movement that makes people sweaty. But it can also come on with um, out of the blue and thermoregulatory changes. There have been a number of studies that have suggested there could be an increased risk of melanoma in Parkinson's patients, and I think there's more to understand about that. Um, and then here's an example of levito, which is something that we can see when we prescribe our patients amantadine. So again, some of these can be part of Parkinson's and some of these can be somewhat iatrogenic. There are a whole host of autonomic symptoms affecting uh, not only the cardiovascular system, but the GI, uh, genitourinary, thermoregulatory. And these have been quite commonly reported, um, probably about 20 to 40 uh, percent. And they can have a significant effect on the quality of life. This is from two studies that suggest that um, of the order of their study, uh, constipation was rated the highest as, as far as affecting quality of life, followed by orthostatic blood pressure changes and nocturia. So there are a number of reasons why patients may uh, get these autonomic symptoms. And this may have to do with the underlying neuropathology of Parkinson's, as well as some of its underlying neurochemical changes. It probably has um, something to do with both central and peripheral nervous system effects. We have changes in the brainstem that affect the norepinephrine system, the cholinergic system, as well as, um, as you can see here, uh, studies that have shown incidental Lewy bodies found in areas that are related to autonomic dysfunction. In the peripheral nervous system, we can see that there are changes in Parkinson's affecting the postganglionic uh, autonomic system, particularly the sympathetic innervation. And here you can see from this study that Lewy bodies can be found in the vagal nerve, in the myenteric plexus, in parts of the spinal cord uh, columns as well. And that's probably partly um, responsible for these autonomic changes. 
We can see them also as a result of medication side effects. So levodopa, for example, as well as dopamine agonists can lower blood pressure. So sometimes this is a dual, a dual hit, if you will, not only from the disease itself, but the medications that we use to treat many of the symptoms. And more and more it's been recognized that we can see autonomic changes in Parkinson's, um, and this just highlights uh, several other conditions, uh, primary autonomic failure and multiple system atrophy, and some of the differences in where uh, the changes are in the autonomic sim systems. So you can see in the Parkinson's uh, with uh, autonomic failure, sometimes their symptoms are a little bit different from uh, the other conditions. Orthostatic hypotension is one that we frequently encounter, uh, and again, um, it probably has both central and peripheral causes. We can see early cardiac sympathetic denervation in Parkinson's, which is also in contrast to sometimes what we see on imaging and uh, um, tests in multiple system atrophy. It's quite common. And, in, and in, uh, in fact, it can actually occur early in uh, the disease or potentially even precede some of the motor signs. Um, if it's very severe and early, we may have concern for uh, MSA as a uh, differential diagnosis. And this may uh, uh, cause other indirect uh, morbidity and uh, dysfunction because this can contribute to falls. If someone's having syncopal episodes, uh, it can contribute to fatigue, uh, sleepiness, and perhaps even cognitive features. A number of GI symptoms are uh, quite common in Parkinson's. Some may be due to uh, medications or um, uh, delayed gastric motility, including nausea and vomiting, but probably the most common that we see is constipation. And now as neurologists, we all wanted to, you know, study the brain or study the nervous system, but I would say in our clinics we spend a good amount of time talking about blood pressure and constipation and sleep and many other non-motor symptoms. There are a number of reasons why patients may have this um, besides um, age, uh, uh, but with Parkinson's they may have a delay in their, how their colon functions. They may have low motility, um, they may have delayed colonic transfer. And this may be due to the underlying pathology of Parkinson's with Lewy bodies. It's been proposed that perhaps this might even be a prodromal marker, so a premotor symptom that could occur, occur years before someone has tremor. <laughs> And there's evidence from this from the Honolulu aging study of Japanese men um, who those with a few bowel movements per day were more likely to develop Parkinson's. And in some colon biopsy studies, this is um, a study depicting a healthy control and deposition of alpha-synuclein. And here you can see the brown staining for alpha-synuclein in a patient who happened to have a colon biopsy and then several years later developed Parkinson's here. This has been under investigation by a lot of, a lot of groups, some with conflicting findings, but um, I think we're going to learn more about this um, in the coming years. Bladder dysfunction is also common, and of course as people get older there can be many different reasons that contribute to this, um, both for men and for women. We can see it early and later, and in, generally, in general um, it leads to uh, detrusor hyperactivity. Patients also may experience sexual dysfunction, and actually this can be uh, more common than probably appreciated. Um, most of the studies actually talk about male sexual dysfunction, um, and this can be related to Parkinson's itself, as well as psychological factors and even Parkinson's medicines. I just put this here because sometimes with the impulse control disorders that we see with dopamine agonists, we can see hypersexuality. I mentioned before the temperature dysfunction, and this can be quite problematic for patients. So they can have excess sweating, they can have flushing, and sometimes this may relate to the timing of their Parkinson's uh, uh, medication cycle. So for some it's actually when they're on and having dyskinesias, and for some people it's when they're off and wearing um, off. So it can be quite complicated and we might need diaries to sort some of this out. And this may also relate to uh, dysfunction in the hypothalamus. So again, much more of the nervous system is involved in Parkinson's. I'm going to say a few words on some of the behavioral uh, symptoms here. Um, 
Uh, and these, of course, are very common. And I would like to highlight uh, later this week there are several sessions specifically devoted to the non-motor uh, symptoms of Parkinson's that will cover behavior and cognition in uh, some great detail. These are common. Uh, again, this may be a premotor symptom. It may occur years before the onset of those motor features and may be due to changes in the brainstem neurochemically related to serotonin and norepinephrine, as well as changes in um, the limbic and frontal pathways. Most typically this presents as, as mood symptoms with sadness or decreased interest, but also with anxiety. We don't typically see uh, some of the symptoms that one might uh, associate with major depression, meaning negative feelings or self-reproach, guilt um, feelings, um, as well as fortunately a lower rate of uh, suicide in uh, patients with uh, major depression. Anxiety is also common. It can be seen in a number of different contexts some of which uh, are related to the comorbid presence of depression, but also into itself. And really what I'd like to highlight here is that anxiety can occur as a non-motor fluctuation. I spoke a little earlier about dyskinesias and motor fluctuations and wearing off, but patients, when they're wearing, their medicine's wearing off, can actually develop panic attacks, shortness of breath, um, full-blown anxiety, uh, symptoms that can actually land them in the emergency room. So it's also it's good to be mindful of some of those symptoms. Psychosis, uh, which has a range from illusions to uh, feeling like there's a sense of presence or shadows to visual hallucinations, all the way to delusions can occur in 50% of patients on chronic therapy. And we know that this contributes greatly to morbidity and mortality. There are a number of risk factors that we think about, including uh, greater um, length of disease, advanced age, trouble with cognition, as well as the dopaminergic medicines that we use uh, to treat uh, many of the Parkinson's symptoms. Visual hallucinations are the most common, but we can see that we can uh, recognize them in uh, other modalities, such as people hearing things um, that aren't necessarily there. There's a complex pathophysiology to them, which can include different effects of medications with increased D2, D3 stimulation in parts of the um, frontal and limbic systems, as well as changes even in the retina, which has dopamine receptors, and a, a relationship with uh, attention and sleep as well. Cognitive impairment is something that we've grown to recognize um, uh, more over the p past uh, several years that can range in slowing of thinking as well as what we would consider mild cognitive impairment all the way to uh, severe dementia. And I just highlight here some of the complaints that we uh, might appreciate that people may say they have slower thinking, it might be harder to multitask, they may have trouble with their short-term memory and finding the right words. So these are some of the domains that we see affected in cognition. And um, this can range uh, from mild to uh, um, full-blown dementia. And I just wanted to highlight, because we're going to talk about some of diagnostic criteria that have been put forth um, through the Movement Disorder Society Task Force, that this is an ongoing effort of um, the whole society in terms of defining different elements of Parkinson's. And here, um, trying to differentiate dementia and Parkinson's from Alzheimer's, as well as a milder form of um, uh, mild cognitive impairment in Parkinson's. We know that these deficits can actually occur early um, and in mild Parkinson's. And these are four studies from newly diagnosed patients that suggest about 20 to 30 percent of them may have some form of mild cognitive deficits. So something we have increasingly recognized um, and may be able to uh, have further studies and offer additional treatments for them. I just want to touch on sleep, and then I will turn it over to my colleague to talk um, a little bit about the etiologies. And sleep is Im important for a number of reasons. It's highly affected in Parkinson's. And not only does it affect the Parkinson's patient, but it also affects the caregiver or spouse. Um, and it's thought that some of the sleep disturbances might represent these premotor symptoms. 
uh, that I uh, particularly REM behavior disorder. There's a wide array of nighttime sleep disturbances, uh, as you can see here, ranging from insomnia or sleep fragmentation to restless leg syndrome or periodic limb movements. Some of these can be Parkinson's related, so people can have recurrent motor symptoms in the middle of the night. They can have cramps, they can have trouble getting out of bed, and there can be other uh, psychiatric symptoms related. This is a video of someone with um, REM behavior disorder. So this is a phenomenon where patients basically act out their dreams when they should be sleeping. And it's been linked to several um, synucleinopathies. And we'll talk a little bit about some of um, what this might mean in terms of premotor symptoms uh, and uh, Parkinson's. And so here's someone in the sleep lab. And you can see he's punching and kicking, and he's, uh, you know, supposed to be still and have loss of REM, um, loss of uh, muscle tone when he's in REM sleep. And you can see, actually, this can be quite disastrous, someone falling out of bed. We also know that people can be sleepy during the daytime, and this is an area that um, probably needs a little bit more study to understand whether this is related to medicines, intrinsic to Parkinson's, related to fatigue and cognition, or some of the medicines. Um, so this is one of the first reports w by which we found out that dopamine agonists made people really sleepy when they started having sleep attacks uh, when they were on the road. And so with that, I will uh, just conclude, um, and I hope you have appreciated that really how complicated Parkinson's is now. Um, there are multiple systems involved, and many of these um, suggest that it's beyond not just a mo mo movement disorder, and that many of these symptoms are not just late stage. So in order to take the best care of our patients, we need to appreciate them early and to ask about them. And then we'll talk a little later about some of the evaluation and management. So thank you. I will turn this. Okay.